If you would ask an evolutionist about the origin of life, he would very confidently tell you that life originated by chemical evolution or life came from chemicals through chemical reactions. And they can be very confident in what they're saying. But you ask them about the subject of homochorality and you will not get a confident statement. Uh, they, to this day, still call it a mystery. It is a problem that they cannot explain. They cannot explain it because of the laws of chemistry says it won't happen. But what happens is that the origin of homochorality becomes a problem for evolutionists because it does not fit in with their preconceived theory of life coming from chemicals. And so, quite literally, homochorality is a square peg that does not fit in the round hole created by evolutionary theory. And so, consequently, they have now taken this search for the origin of homochorality into outer space, now claiming that life originated on some meteorite on its way to Earth. And we're going to talk about that today, showing some of the problems with that uh, with their proposed explanation. My goal today is obviously not to convince you that evolution is false, because I'm sure we all believe that anyway, but I want to just uh, focus on a few different points that just show on how little evidence they're willing to have to create a theory upon. <laughs> and that's the scary part, because one of the areas which they try to develop a new idea on uh, and this idea for the search for homochorality uses what's called a symmetry breaking process. And um, as a chemist, I have a problem with that because that sounds like it's impossible. <laughs> well, to me it is. But uh, we have to understand that they're willing to go to the extreme of proposing symmetry breaking processes instead of believing in a creator God. And it just amazes me to what extremes they're willing to go to. So today, to talk about this problem of chorality, chorality is a scientific term for handedness, and that uh, our hands are a good example of handedness. We have a left hand, we have a right-handed version, and uh, it turns out that they may be very similar in different ways, but they're not identical. They're just mirror images of each other. And just like our hands, chemical molecules can have a left-handed and a right-handed version. And it turns out, in chemistry, it's known that chorality always exists when a carbon is bonded to four different atoms. And right here I show the amino acid structure of both enantiomers. And because of symmetry, there will always be two mirror image configurations for each chiral carbon. And it turns out that because of symmetry, two configurations will always form because the fourth bond can approach from two different directions. And as we see right here, that has the, this fourth bond, it's labeled W, is coming in to a carbon molecule that has a choice of coming in from the top or coming in from the bottom. And because this is a planar molecule, uh, that it turns out that there's an equal opportunity of coming in from the top or the bottom, giving you two different uh, tetrahedral structures for carbon. And so that's the problem that's there, is that the chemistry that is going to exist and is going to be known of always forms at least two different configurations, never just one. And, that's, and so the result is always a 50-50 mixture, and this mixture is called a racemic mixture. Well, homochorality is when a chemical molecule is found to exist as only one of the unique configurations that are possible, even though many others are possible. And so homochorality is a problem that exists everywhere. It turns out that we know it's important that everywhere that, everywhere that is present, it is present with 100% purity and there is no living organism known that exists with random or mixed chorality. And we know that homochorality is everywhere. We can find amino acids and proteins, DNA, RNA, the polysaccharides. In fact, every single cell of your body contains chorality in some form or another. <coughs> and just to give you an idea of how big this problem is for the evolutionist, Although amino acids only have two possible structures, you can see for proteins, DNA, and polysaccharides that these are just the number of possible chiral isomers that are possible, not to mention the sequence isomers that are there. These are just the number of chiral isomers. That proteins can have as many as 1,000 chiral carbon. Well, two to the 1,000, it's about 10 to the 301. DNA was something like 18 billion chiral carbons. It's got a much larger number. 
but it gives you an idea that uh, this is no small problem, that if you have this potential for a number of icebergs, and yet in our bodies we only find one, always one, not more than one. And so the question is, where did this whole crowd come from? Well, evolutionists would like to say that it came from chemicals, by chemical reactions, but it turns out that's known not to be true. It's known by chemistry that new homo, new homo chorality cannot be formed first by chemical reactions. And, can't, and there are ways to form chorality with chemical reactions, but those reactions always require pre-existing homo chorality. And so the formation of homo chorality for the very first time cannot be done by chemical reaction, and that's a chemical fact. It's in, you'll find it in any textbook in chemistry, and that's the problem that uh, evolutionists have today. Chemistry does not explain why it exists. And so these two facts of chemistry concerning homo chorality is what is the problem or the mystery for evolutionists. The natural processes can only form receiving mixtures, and it means that all natural chemical reactions, I mean natural means that uh, there's no other homochorality anywhere to direct it in any certain particular way that in just a natural random chance chemical reactions it will always form both mirror image structures just like I showed right here for the amino acids. If you try to make an amino acid you're always going to get the two possible configurations existing as mirror images. Fact number two is that every known chemical reaction capable of forming new homochorality in a molecule Require, requires pre-existing homochorality to be already present. That many of you may be familiar with asymmetric induction and chiral auxiliaries or have heard about crystallization, chromatography, or enzymes as ways to induce chorality into a molecule. And these, and these techniques, they do work. But each one of those techniques and by one of these processes down here incorporates some type of pre-existing homochorality there. So it always takes homochorality to create new homochorality. And so the question is, where did that first homochorality come from? And that's why it's a big mystery to them. And so the mystery is that the, re the receiving products formed by natural processes are not found in living organisms, and the biological molecules that are present cannot be made without homochorality already there. And so this is a major dilemma for, um, for evolutionists. Evolution cannot explain it, and chemistry does not allow it. And so they are forced to make a different decision. Now for many people, including myself, these two chemical facts should be enough information to refute evolution and accept God as the Bible as the creator of all things. And more than anything else, it's this idea of chorality that helped convince me that uh, our creator God is truly a creator of things because it is hard to imagine life without homo chorality in our bodies and homo chorality can only be explained by a creative act of God because the only way that creality can actually exist in our bodies is if God created us to have the chorality that we have that he made all amino acids left-handed all proteins made of left-handed amino acids and all the others and so this idea of evolutionary stepwise processes just makes no sense because it doesn't matter how long you do it, the laws of chemistry say it will never happen. And so, um, but unfortunately, most evolutionists are still unwilling to accept the idea of a creator God, and they have now uh, taken their search for homochorality into outer space. And so now they're saying that amino acids were formed in deep space they became enriched by contact with uh, circular polarized light as it was passing on a meteorite, and then that meteorite came to Earth, bringing those uh, enriched amino acids to Earth. And that's the basis for their theory, uh, how it originated in outer space. Well, as a chemist, I was going to take a look at what they were proposing, looking at this idea, and if what they just said was true, as their explanation, these four points must be true, and all four of these points must be proven to be true and to be existing and capable of doing what it says it is doing. And one is that circular polarized light is capable of destroying right-handed amino acids. We'll talk about that later. And uh, circular polarized light must exist in outer space. And the enrichment of amino acids was actually and truly extraterrestrial. And the meteorites can uh, transport enriched amino acids to Earth. And so if the evolution theory is going to have any meaning at all, it must answer these questions here and show that it works. 
Well, point one is based on some work by Meyer Henrik back in 2005, where he took a solid film of racemic leucine, irradiated it with a circular polarized light at a wavelength of 180 nanometers, putting it in the ultraviolet region. And out of that, he saw an enriched mixture where L-leucine was enriched over the D-leucine by 2.6% in atomeric excess. And so that was an interesting work because for the first time it appears that some process was able to create an enrichment taking place when most understandings of chemical reactions would say that wouldn't happen. So the question is, what did truly happen? Well, the authors of the work, they started with a solid film, irradiated with circular polarized light, and then took that solid film, put it through a polarimeter to see this 2.6% uh, in atomic excess. But the, and then based on only that amount of work, they concluded that the right-hand amino acid of leucine was physically and literally destroyed. And uh, I find that very interesting because after making that claim, they did not show any evidence for loss of material. Uh, so there's all kinds of ways you could show how the right-handed uh, leucine could have been destroyed by labeling studies or other types of uh, labeling ways to determine loss, but none of those were ever done. And so it, it leads to a major question. And furthermore, it turns out that this reaction with the ultraviolet CPL, as it's called, does not work with all amino acids. Uh, tryptophan and proline are not enriched or destroyed with, uh, with UV CPL. And some wavelengths increase it in, in the left-handed and other wavelengths form mi mixtures enriched with right-handed amino and so all of a sudden, we realize that there is no general method for destroying amino acids. In fact, they haven't even shown the ability to destroy anything right now. And the fact is, any light that might be capable of sufficient energy to destroy these amino acids would actually destroy both enantiomers, not just one. So they're making a lot of claims here that are not backed up by the literature. There is no observational data that, to provide to even help us believe that it could have happened. So we have no reason to believe that it really happened that way. And it turns out that uh, the result that we see with 2.6% in atomic excess could have been formed by circular dichroism, and that it's known in uh, circular dichroism that right and left-handed enantiomers of a molecule can absorb the CPL at different rates or different amounts. And so it turns out that it's possible that this 2% enantiomeric excess is nothing more than just how the different isomers of uh, leucine react to the circular polarized light, and it is not a true enrichment. In fact, which makes this just a false positive result, nothing more than just experimental error. And so the other point that comes to my mind is that if there really is a process that is physically capable of destroying right-handed chirality and even leucine right here, why did it stop at 2.6%? If I was a chemist and I had discovered that result right there, I would have let my machine go for days, weeks, <laughs> months to see how long it would have taken if I could have got all of them out. But it turns out all he ever got out of was 2.6, whoops, you know, 2.6% excess which is very much in line with the differences you'd expect for circular dichroism. So it turns out their, the reported conclusions were not based on any kind of loss of material, and no effort was made to rule out alternate explanations, and there's no literature precedent or solid evidence to support their theory, and so we have no reason to believe that, uh, that amino acids can be destroyed by circular polarized light. So point one of their mechanism did not work out. Point two is the fact that CPL exists in outer space. Uh, these authors here, Fosavo, Hasseri, Prudet, and Tauber, have uh, theorized that uh, circular polarized light is thought to be formed in outer space as starlight is scattered from the elongated interstellar dust grains, whose long axis is turned to be oriented perpendicular to the galactic magnetic field. A lot of words there, but anyway. Uh, they also say that it's they believe that in a star-forming region such as the Orion molecular cloud, that low-mass young stars could experience strong CPL with signal handedness when externally radiated by light from a massive star. 
there's a lot of grandiose statements in there and a lot of um, conditional words like thought and believe and could. But anyway, what we do know is that from the literature that uh, Jeremy Bailey in 1998 has detected that infrared CPL is present in nebulae, but not the uh, required UV CPL. And it's also fascinating that uh, the authors that actually propose the uh, existence of CPL say that CPL has never been detected in outer space at wavelengths less than 200 nanometers due to uh, light scattering off of the dust particles. And so that, create, that creates a, another problem. If CPL is created by scattered light from dust particles in outer space, and these same dust particles prevent the long di distance detection of UPCPL, how close does the passing rock fragment have to be to the UPL source in order to receive an atomeric enrichment? And that's a very critical question to ask and because of the inverse square law of physics which says that the intensity of a light source is, is inversely proportional to the square of the distance of the object from the light source. You know, so in order for some passing rock fragment to get enriched by uh, CPL from a starlight, it means it's gonna have to get either very close or close to a very intense light. And uh, it turns out that uh, CPL is neither one, it's neither close, neither intense. If we look at this inverse square law, if we assume that Meyer Hendricks' work is even correct, which there's no reason to believe that, but if we even give him credit for that, the light source at a polarimeter is only about one to two centimeters away from the sample. And uh, given that the enrichment at this distance is 2.6%, uh, let's assume the exact same process is taking place by irradiation of a rock fragment by a passing, I mean, of a, from a starlight onto a passing rock fragment. And if we assume that this rock fragment could get 10 meters, just 10 meters away from the light source in outer space, then using these, uh, the laws, the inverse square law, it turns out that if we factor in the, dis the difference between one centimeter and 10 meters, that there's a million fold difference in the enrichment expected to be found by exactly the same process that Maya Andrew did. And I think it's all safe to say that if any rock fragment got within 10 meters of a star, it's not going to get out of that uh, <laughs> gravity field. <laughs> so all of a sudden, there's not very good evidence there. Plus, even if we give them that, the CPL content of life from 180 stars is measured. And the maximum observed fraction of CPL and starlight in all of these 180 stars was 6 times 10 to the minus 4, uh, quite a small number. And uh, even on our own sun, CPL is on the order of 10 to the minus 6. So we're dealing with a very weak, possibly even non-existent, because they can, this, is, this CPL right here, this is all detectable CPL. We already know they can't detect the UV part of it. And so we don't even know the UV part is even there. I mean, what is there is weak and very distant. And so there's no reason to believe that uh, enrichment is going to occur in this way. So with CPL and starlight extremely weak and the inability to detect the presence of this UV CPL and starlight, point two of this, uh, of their explanation has low literature precedent. There's no evidence that the required UV UP CPL has even exist in outer space. The third one uh, is the enrichment that was observed is extraterrestrial. Now the entire <coughs> claim that enrichment is extraterrestrial is based on the finding that uh, in the Murchison meteorite and also in the Orgel meteorite that the, uh, the ratios of isovaline, the D isomer over the D isomer of isovaline was enriched 18% in Murchison and 15% in isovaline. And it turns out in the Murchison meteorite shown right here, the they discovered some 70 amino acids, 50 of those amino acids do not exist in living organisms. And that of the other, or of that 70, 15 amino acids are shown right here. These 15 are just the five carbon amino acids that were present in meteorites. And that the amino acids that were looked at 
our president parts pavilion levels, and in order to detect them, they had to put a fluorescence uh, tag on it so they could actually see it. And then they had to use GC mass spec to detect it. And so, and then after doing all of that, only one amino acid out of 70 shows unequal ratios right there. Peaks 9 and 11 are D and L isovaline respectively, and the Wargill meteorite and the Burgesson meteorite showed unequal ratios. Well, <clears throat> without getting into the argument so much, basically, several factors can explain their observed unequal ratios, and it turns out that uh, there's still a very big debate on whether or not earthly contamination took place versus extraterrestrial tree enrichment. And so it's obvious that more work is needed to evaluate these claims, but the problem is scientists have already accepted their conclusion of extraterrestrial enrichment are now assuming it's a fact and are going on. And that's the, the scary part that's taking place. But the problems with this conclusion, whether or not it's gonna happen or not, there's a theoretical problem that bothers me that uh, Glavin's inclusion treats enrichment as if it is a natural process, just like racemization, and that his conclusion also assumes the laws of symmetry are optional or not in effect. Now, we all know that the process of racemization occurs because of chemistry, that when we have an optically active amino acid, because it goes through a planar transition state, it's gonna form a racemic amino acid. It does this because of symmetry and that uh, symmetry is what's creating the racemization. But if we look at enrichment, the idea of going from a receiving component to something which is optically active is gonna violate symmetry. And so all of a sudden, you can't have a process which occurs because of symmetry, and one that violates symmetry has basically two natural processes, because they're not. And so, the reality is evolutionists are willing to propose that amino acids are formed in deep space as racemic amino acids, thereby admitting that the laws of symmetry are working in deep space when amino acids were originally created there first. But in order to propose that extraterrestrial enrichment occurs, these same laws of symmetry have now become optional. And <clears throat> so likewise, this point has not been demonstrated to be proved. In fact, their conclusions were only accepted as truth and never proven. And so now we have three different points out of those four that have not been shown to be true and no evidence to support that. And the last one is actually very strong evidence because I don't know how anybody can believe in anything regardless of whether or not Meyer Hendricks work was good or whether or not Glavin's work was good with the finding of enriched uh, amino acids. Even if all of that is true, I have no idea how they can get that to form life on Earth. And so the question is, can meteorites transport amino acids to Earth? Well, we already know that the meteorite passes through our atmosphere, that the outer surface of the meteorite is burned away. Well, and the temperature of doing that is 1650 degrees, which is more than enough to burn any organic molecule. And so once a meteorite goes through our at Earth's atmosphere, we can say one of the three things. One, any amino acid present on the outside of the rock fragment would be burned upon entry into Earth's atmosphere. And any amino acid found in or on the land of the meteorite had to be on the inside of the rock fragment while it was in outer space. But if that's the case, how did amino acids get to the inside of a rock fragment in outer space? And how did amino acids on the inside of a rock fragment get irradiated with uh, CPLs and starlight? And how could amino acid on the inside of a meteorite have any ability to create life on Earth, even if it got to Earth? And so we're looking at basically none of the four points of any literature precedence and no data to substantiate their claims. In fact, the entire theory of origin of homochirality was based on two articles of unsubstantiated and unproven conclusions. But the problem I have, there's an alarming trend that the mystery for the origin of homochirality has been solved by the discovery of symmetry breaking processes such as those described by Glavin. Uh, Glavin doesn't really talk about it so much, but many other scientists who talk about his work are too busy to term symmetry breaking processes, and that's the part that I have a hard time with. That nothing in the scientific literature would suggest that symmetry is capable of being broken, or even that it should be thought to be possible, but and yet, they propose that. And so 
Homo corralensi is quite literally the square peg that we talked about earlier. And to think that a symmetry breaking process can solve the origin of homo corality is like solving the square peg in a round hole problem by claiming that a square peg can sometimes be round in outer space. Because that's really what they're doing. They're trying to change a physical property of a molecule. And homo corality is just that. Homo corality refers to the shape of a molecule. And shape is a physical property of an object, so therefore homochirality is a physical property of a chemical molecule. Well, that means if you're going to believe in a symmetry breaking process, you have to believe that there's an exception to physical property can actually exist. And I think we know the answer to that. That is impossible. You know, in principle, there might be some exception found to a law of science somewhere. I say possibly, it has never been done yet, but even if that were possible, you still cannot have an exception to a physical property because a physical property describes the properties of a known molecule. And so this idea of breaking symmetry begs the question, why do evolutionists claim that symmetry breaking processes are needed to explain the origin of homo corality? And I say, well, symmetry breaking processes is their new buzzword. And it's just another attempt to direct attention away from the lack of evidence for their claims. Because that's really what's there. Without that symmetry breaking process, there would not be any evidence to go on. And once you give up on the idea of uh, symmetry breaking processes and, and look at other possible routes, then you have to believe that uh, Genesis 2-7 is correct. That the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And so if you give up on symmetry breaking processes, you have to say that God made the man living and not the dust of the ground. And so today, evolutionary scientists are more willing to entertain criticism for breaking symmetry than admitting they do not know the origin of homo gravity, or worse, admitting that the evidence may be better explained by a creator God than by natural processes. And so, <clears throat> I conclude on a positive note that the fact that evolutionists resort to symmetry breaking processes and the physically impossible to solve the problem shows that we as creationists are doing our job very well <laughs> because they are scrambling like no end to find some way to explain homo corality without admitting there is a God. And like I said before in the beginning, it just amazes me to what extremes they're willing to go to. They're willing to believe in the impossible. They're willing to propose symmetry breaking processes are possible, even though there's no reason to believe that is the case. And so I thank you for your attention today. And please